Kia ora koutou, ko Douglas Walker, toko ingoa. I'm here this morning with uh, the wonderful Jenny Pollock. Um, Jenny has been um, a long-serving teacher, and Jenny is the uh, immediate past president for Earth and Space Science Educators of New Zealand. So Jenny's going to run through um, the scholarship Earth and Space Science material with you this morning, um, and this webinar will be available afterwards. You'll be able to go play it back through, check over parts that you need to, and hopefully uh, get the best preparation you can for your exam. While we're going, if you'd like to pop any questions into chat, please do so. Um, and myself or my colleague, Andrew Sargent, will um, manage those questions. And we'll either interrupt Jenny at an opportune moment to ask them, or we'll have saved them until the end um, and ask Jenny to, to run through those when we've got a bit of time at the end. So thank you, Jenny, for all the work that you've done in preparing for this and for sharing your knowledge with the students. Um, over to you. Right, thank you very much. I'm um, called Jenny Pollock, Toko Wingo. And as, um, as Doug said, I've been doing Earth and Space Scholarship for a long period of time, so hopefully I'll be able to help you in these three hours. So first of all, I'm going to start with just kind of going over what you're going to see on Friday and how to actually approach the, the, the scholarship exam. So I'm going to actually share a... Um, I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint. There we are. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this. This has got a particularly um, nice, nice character on it. So I'm just going to play this and then it. Here we are. Kairalo Kia toi mātou i o rawa mana. Tuie ai i. Great, and that was actually gifted to one of us by one of our um, very special earth and space um, people called Mary, um, Mary Manning. Okay, so I'm going to go... Oopsie, sorry. I'm going to go over the what the scholarship exam is all about. And some of you may have already um, know all about this, so I'm actually not going to take very long. But there are just some things to point out that you may not have quite realised. So, first of all, you must, you're going to actually be given, and I'm, I'll show you this, you're going to be actually given two papers. One is the, um, the first one, the black and white one, is the one in which you have the questions and you ha have plenty of space for, for writing answers. So you get quite a few pages. And, of course, you can ask for extra, there's extra pages at the back of the paper, and also you can ask for extra paper if you run out of that. There also is a resource booklet, which has actually got um, the resource material that the examiner thinks that you'll need to help you with the question, and but is stuff that you probably won't have actually learnt in, in class or in your revision. Uh, there's going to be three questions. All three questions must be answered. You're not going to get a scholarship if you're not answering all three questions. <clears throat> so if you've done two questions pretty well and you look at the third and you haven't got a clue, at least still give it a go. Um, read it and see if there's some aspects you can answer. You may find that is actually just enough to bump you over some critical line. Um, I've mentioned about the, the two um, booklets. Uh, note that each question is worth eight marks, and a mark is generally for a kind of a well-developed point. The highest mark, uh, the highest mark possible for the exam. Is twenty is twenty four, a scholarship level answer for a question will score five or six marks. A four is generally when you're answering at an excellent level. Scholarship we expect that extra something, 
and you will score um, be scoring five or six marks. An outstanding answer will gain seven or eight marks. And, of course, from the outstanding uh, people, that's when we also choose a, a, a top scholar is chosen. Now, please note that questions will be asked about unfamiliar contexts. Now, there will be aspects of that question which will be familiar, um, and you therefore you have to sort of draw on your knowledge of that particular aspects. But the actual initial kind of context that you're looking at is going to be unfamiliar, because the thing about scholarship is it can't be a predictable exam. You don't think, oh, we haven't had such and such for a while. We'll pr probably have it this time. It doesn't work that way in scholarship. There, there's unfamiliar context. And the other thing is they'll have links to more than one earth and space science aspect. Now, if you've got access to the, the folders and you will be able to also um, press on this link, um, press on the uh, link that's in the timetable you will have got, you'll be able to go to the earth and space resources folders. In there, there is a webinars folder. And in that, there is a folder which is actually, I've gone and um, gone over five questions, each of which kind of shows a, a different aspect of what to expect. And a really good idea is if you go over those. Um, when answering questions, you have to link your own knowledge, understanding of the resource material, and you have to put that together and show understanding or even make a kind of a conceptual link where you go, ah, okay, right, therefore that's probably got to happen or as a consequence or something like that. And that is what is meant by high-level critical thinking, analysing, evaluating. But you just do kind of the best with the information that you've got and show the best understanding that you can. Right, notice that there's probably quite a lot to read. Um, sorry, I'll go back again. I've just got the Zoom. Here it is. Zoom was covering the writing. There's a lot to read, and it is worth spending about five to ten minutes at the, the beginning of the exam reading through the questions. Then you've got to plan your time carefully. And I, I recommend that you start with a question that you actually feel familiar with because that also gives you confidence. If you start with one you're familiar with, you have a good go at it, that's going to give you confidence that you can do, tackle the ones that maybe you don't think you know quite so well. Okay, this exam does require kind of, you know, reading and thinking time as well as writing. And then plan it. You don't want to spend so long on one question that you don't actually have time to effectively look at another question that you may know quite a lot about. Now here's an example of a question resource book material and this is one of the questions that I've actually gone over but do notice that this question and if we're actually looking at the question read every single bit of the question don't go straight to the to the question I, th I think these days there are actually bullet points in the question don't go straight to the bullet point Read the introduction. In, in these papers, every word is written for a reason and every word of these questions is considered and gone over. So you need to read every single part of it. But the actual question is considering the conditions that make the ACC such a strong cold current and the global importance of ACC, discuss fully what research in the Macquarie Ridge area is both important and challenging. Now, you're going to know stuff about the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. <laughs> um, you also know, will know the global importance of the importance of the ACC current, okay? The second part of the question, discuss fully why research is, is both important and challenging. That's more a nature of science type question, and that's a bit of what I'm um, going to be going over today is the nature of sort of science quite aspect. This is how scientists work because with earth and space science you don't have nice little kind of fair tests you can actually do in a lab all the time. You're often going out and discovering stuff that is quite new. 
But what's really important is that research is, is, is very thoroughly done, it is rigorous, it is valid, and it is, it, you have um, very good, solid research can be used, which is done in different ways from the standard fair test that people are going to be used to. Now, notice you'll have two pages of, of resource booklet material that you can, so you can open out your book and there's the two pages. You don't um, have to keep on turning pages. Okay, I'm not going to go over that question at all. I've actually gone over that in, in one of those webinars. So you can go to that. And at this stage, if you are feeling confident about your content knowledge, then I suggest you go over past questions, read them. If you don't have time to try to do them, um, then look at the look at the uh, look at the assessment schedule and work backwards from that and work out how um, why there is something is mentioned in the assessment schedule. Don't be put off by the assessment schedule; they're going to look really big, and they are because everything that needs to be considered that a marker needs to consider is in that answer but that does not reflect the amount you have to write. You just have to make sure, particularly if you're going for top marks, that you have got very well, eight, very well developed, showing understanding, showing insight type answers, and that's where your marks will come from. Okay, now here's hints for the exam. Do read everything very carefully. Highlight key aspects or underline, that's always a good idea. I've talked about being confident. Do write down quick notes to get you started. Um, and I'll go on to the next point. Do draw and annotate diagrams if you can express some knowledge and understanding better that way. Uh, let's just go to the diagrams first. That is um, pretty important. If So, for example, if you're wanting to explain um, plate tectonics and you're a very good draw. Um, very good at, at drawing diagrams, then do that, but make sure they are very well labelled, very well annotated, because that can be con that will be considered by the marker as as part of your answer. Write down quick notes. Now you can either, if you don't want to write diagrams, you can write it in the diagram box because there's always a big diagram box. If you um, if you, but you can also just write it at the start of the top page. And, and markers will go over those notes, especially if there's a, a gap in your answer and they might go back and look at the notes to actually see if you'd mentioned it in the notes but hadn't actually got around to putting it in, in the actual body of the answer. Okay, right. Now, the last two are quite important. Don't just reword the question or the resource material. You must say something new. You may put like half a sentence from the resource material to kind of just get you going. But don't just dump that. Don't just put resource material in or reword the resource material. That's not going to um, get you a mark. And don't just regurgitate, regurgitate class or tutorial notes in your answer. Draw on your knowledge and the information in the resource booklet to reach conclusions and to demonstrate high-level critical thinking by analysing and evaluating scientific information. That's quite a mouthful, that last bit. That's when you're putting the knowledge you know and something from the resource book together and you are showing that you have you understand that concept and maybe there is also a kind of leap of understanding or realising or something new that you think of. And put that down, because if your reasoning is sound, even if your conclusion might be inaccurate, if your reasoning, how you've got to it is sound, that can also be considered. Okay, we don't need to worry about that. Now, by this by this time, you should know this, but um, obviously you, you're needing to learn about Earth systems, interacting systems, and astronomical systems. Uh, and this is the a little bit about the nature of science, and I'm going to go over this today. So the four main parts of the nature of science are understanding about science, what is knowledge and how it develops and interacts with society. Investigating in science, carrying out different investigations, communicating in science, participating and contributing.
Um, you're most likely to get questions about investigating in science, and it will never be a whole question. It will just be part of a question, and it won't be necessarily every single question. But um, investigating in science is is um, one that you're likely to get. And later on, I'm going to introduce you to um, various terms like the importance of baseline data and things like that. Uh, communicating in science is implicit. And one of the things about scholarship is in earth and space science is you, particularly at outstanding level, your answer needs to be literate. Not a whole lot of um, bullet points or anything like that. Um, not kind of snatches of sentences rather than proper sentences. And certainly writing that is eligible. It, Fine if you've got bad writing, as long as it can be read. But if it can't be read, it is way too difficult for a busy marker to try and mark. So you need to be literate, particularly at the outstanding level. Literacy, your ability to communicate, becomes important. Uh, participating and contributing, bringing a scientific perspective to decisions and actions appropriate to socio-scientific issues. Now, I've gone over in the webinar series, I've gone over one question, which was to do with mining um, rare earth metals from the bottom of volcanoes. And interestingly, that's been in the newspaper in the last few days. And so if you want to look at what a socio-scientific issue looks like in a scholarship question, then go and find the, the folder with the webinars in. And then there's one folder that's got five questions in, and one of them is about the mining. And so you may get a, um, a question about an issue. And in, I think, in the um, introductory folder, because remember there's, there's six folders or five folders, and the introductory folder, I think that is where you can get, there is a list of possible socio-scientific issues that, that possibly might be tested. Okay, and we've talked about the six sections, and so I'm not going to actually um, go over that. But the, I'll just go to the next slide. So it's really it's a really good idea to go over old questions. Also, the 2013 sample paper, which is labelled 2013S, that was the um, there, the, there was the first scholarship exam in Earth and Space Science was in 2013. And so there was a transition paper from what used to be a science scholarship to show teachers the type of question that might be in the new ESS scholarship. The questions aren't quite at scholarship um, level, but they are really good. They show you a really good ways in which context can be used. So, for example, uh, one is about um, deposits of marine debris at Kaikoura that actually shows evidence of there being past tsunamis in that area. So that's that's a good one with the context of tsunamis. Um, that's a good one to look at. There's also some old questions that are oldy that are old. Um, and are good ones, and they are also worth going over. Please note again, they are not at actually scholarship level now, but they certainly show you a contact context and introduce how information can be strung together. So there's one actually which links um, links erosion of, of the Southern Alps uh, to the fact that that can actually make volcanoes more violent in the North Island. And it tells a really interesting story of how matter is actually cycled in New Zealand. So it is worth actually going over that one because it integrates so much um, of, of to do with geology and other aspects as well. Right. Uh, when you're learning your work, when you have going over your work, and by hopefully by now you have learnt most of the content and you're just going over it, Think about how certain aspects linked, e.g. geology and the surface feature of Mars, ocean and atmosphere interacting. And I've again, in the questions that I've gone over, um, there's, there's hints about that. Okay, and there are online exemplars that shows what outstanding in scholarship looks like. 
Okay, so I'm now going to stop sharing there. And what I'm going to do now is start resharing. And I've got, I want to just go over those different folders and how they are useful. So we will, hang on, let's have a look at this. No, I don't want that one. Sorry, it'll just take me a minute. Just give me a minute to actually find what I want. Um, Uh, we'll go to this one. Sorry, there's just... Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, so... When, when you actually look at the different folders, so let's go to this, and hopefully you can still all see this. At this stage, this, this folder, which is... Um, the C folder, ESC sections for revision, is probably the most important one, particularly if you haven't looked at anything yet. And just be aware that if you have not done Level 2 and Level 3 Earth and Space Science, you need to go back and be learning some Level 2 stuff, particularly in the geology and particularly in aspects of astronomy. And in each of these folders, there is a there is a document that says read this first. And I'm going to go over these because it does give key points. And I suspect that these are things that have not been often been read. So here we are. Um, sorry, I'm just checking that wasn't the message I needed to look at to do with this. And now for some reason, this is actually not in the middle of the page. And I'm so Sorry about that. I'll just put this up again and see if I can get it in the middle of the page. Yeah, okay, there we are. Right, so in every one of these folders there's this document. And if you haven't read them, go back and read them anyway. But I just want to go <coughs> over key points. Now, astronomy is um, a little bit tricky to kind of know what to learn and actually to know what to uh, what to actually to revise, but there are some recommendations here. You can learn the, what's in the astronomy folder in any order that you like. There are three aspects. One is level two revision for scholarship, and you to go over that, but you do not need to know that in detail. In that folder, you'll find some very good revision sheets on on the stars and planetary stuff, but most of the questions are likely to be on planetary science. That is on our um, solar system or perhaps related to a, um, a solar system elsewhere, an exosolar system. But it is worth just looking through the Level 2 scholarship stuff because just so you're actually familiar with it, and there was a very good question in 2015 and this is one of the ones that's in those folders I keep telling you about, on habitable zones around red dwarfs. And it did actually give you some preliminary information in the resource book about red dwarfs. But the fact if you already knew what a red dwarf was, it does save you that kind of sort of trying to sort of mull it over type time actually in the exam. So I would actually familiarise yourself with the stuff, but don't do a hardcore learn. Now, astronomy for scholarship, planetary science. This is important because of a lot of questions have been on planets and moons integrated with other aspects such as geological features, e.g. there was a 2013 question on tectonics and Mars. Why is Olympus Mons so, so large? Why are some volcanoes in lines? Why is there a tectonic gash? How would you know whether there was going to be any... Um, how would you know if there were earthquakes on Mars still? Is there likely to be tectonic movement on Mars still? That sort of stuff. So, so learn about the basic characteristics of key planets and moon. And also I would go over the, um, the PowerPoints and notes on solar system and possible life as well because that's a very good context and there may be a question 
on this. Now, below is is important. Um, astronomy, in the stricter sense of the word, 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 starts outside our solar system, but involves in um, a lot of kind of maths and physics. This is an Earth and Space Science exam. It's not a maths and physics exam. So there are extra resources there, but they get quite difficult. Read until the calculations start, unless you understand the maths. But note that mathematical understanding is not assessed in Earth and Space um, Scholarship. So if you have mathematical knowledge and you put it down, it's that's not marked because this is an Earth and Space Science Scholarship and we have to be fair particularly to the students who have studied Earth and Space Science. You're welcome to write stuff down, and it may help focus your mind in some way, but just be aware that the maths won't be marked. There can be understanding, though, expressed in words. That, that's what we're hoping Earth and Space Science have, that understanding, that, um, but not necessarily the mathematical calculations behind it. Okay, so so that's the read this first for astronomy. The next one I'm going to go over the geology or earth science. Oh, and I've just actually turned that off by mistake. I will go back to that. Uh, right, here we go. Now, geology, geology, this is an enormous section and a little bit overwhelming. This is where it actually helps if you has, have done level two because you will have gone over this. Um, there are many different parts that come under geology, um, earth sciences, and also a lot of geology is also kind of integrated with other aspects. So, for example, the water cycle has got a strong geological function. The rock cycle, of course, interacts with um, weathering and erosion, which is water and and air. And, air. Uh, and so you're kind of learning that as you go. And the other cycle, which is the carbon cycle, of course, is the great cycle that combines all aspects of the, of the Earth system. And remember that the Earth system is the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and the atmosphere. And we're learning aspects of the biosphere that are relevant to Earth and space, which is your phytoplankton, your how plants might affect erosion, kind of that sort of stuff. Right. Now, there's lots of good PowerPoints there. Know your New Zealand tectonics in general. You might have learned about hazards in um, Level 2, and that's important stuff to know, but you need to know the good old general New Zealand tectonics. And in this, in this folder, you will actually find a um, underwater topography map, which is a really important map to study. And if you look back through past papers, there's often a little subsection of this map. So know the aspects in this map. And if, if you don't know that, if there's time at the end, I may go over that. But that's, that's a pretty important thing to know. In the PowerPoints, <coughs> That is actually broken down a bit. Okay, so back to this. Right, so um, I've mentioned about the map in number one here. A portion of this map has often appeared in the resource book for a geology-based question. Make sure you understand what it's showing. Identify the tectonic plate boundary. Which parts are made of oceanic crust and which are continental? That's fundamental. The different tectonic features on land and offshore and how they were formed, the continental, sh continental shelf and its features such as canyons, right? All really important stuff to know. Revise what causes the different types of volcanoes and land and underwater and what causes earthquakes and tsunamis. So that's actually straight out of your hazard stuff. Erosion and weathering, something that is not always covered it's covered briefly maybe in Level 2 as if you actually did the uh, the field study standard rather than the hazards one. But it is really important to know and there is a PowerPoint and notes on that in that folder. 
Um, it's kind of the poor relative in a way of geology sometimes because tectonics is a bit more dramatic. But you can't have tectonics without erosion and weathering. Erosion and weathering, tectonics raises the land and and te- um, erosion wears it down again so that matter can be recycled because matter has to be cycled. Matter doesn't come from outside and, unless you get the odd asteroid attack. Okay. How Earth scientists collect and interpret evidence. Now, that's something I'm going to be going over over today. It's really important for Earth science and geologists to find out what has happened in the past and what is likely to happen in the future. And they must be able to collect valid and reliable data, often in the field, and reach valid conclusions, often when they can't do stuff back in the lab. Uh, important to know the rock cycle as well. And again, to make sure you study practice questions. So that is the geology. Right. The next ones aren't quite so long from memory. Ocean and atmosphere. And this is all the kind of level three stuff. Again, there is excellent PowerPoints, excellent notes, excellent revision sheets. Um, in in these folders for you to learn. And you can read this in any section you like. Make sure you know your Level 3 ocean atmosphere at to an excellence level. Okay? Or a, at very least a high merit, but hopefully to an excellent level. Um once you finish um, revising, look at how the ocean and atmosphere interact, e.g. convection cells and how they form surface currents, exchange of carbon dioxide in the ocean, that sort of thing. So look how that interaction is going on. Also go over the carbon and water cycles. Now, that there are three big cycles that are the integrating cycles that, that go between all four systems. And this is the carbon, the water, and the rock cycle section. These show how the hydrosphere, geosphere, atmosphere, and biosphere interrelate and are dependent on each other. Um, and so these these are important to know and to understand. And occasionally there has been questions about the carbon and water and rock cycles. So understand them. Also revise and understand major associated aspects such as climate change and ocean acidification. Now, climate change, there is a very good um, PowerPoint in the in the cycle section, which I'll show you in a minute. Make sure you go over that. And if there's time in this webinar, I may actually go over this again in the webinar. Um, also, ocean acidification. Now, ocean acidification, I know, is often done in chemistry, and the chemists go far more into the actual equilibrium reactions than we do. Pretty much what is in the notes is the standard is that we're looking for for earth and space science. So you don't have to worry too much about the um, the, the um, more detailed aspects of equilibrium. But you do need to realise that there are um, interactions in the ocean that can go one way and another, unlike the classical chemical reaction that we're used to, the burning of magnesium ribbon, for example, where something starts and then it stops and you'll never get what you started with back in here. Um, so make sure you know um, ocean acidification at that level. Again, practice questions. And uh, if you... Back in that initial PowerPoint that I showed you, it does actually show the sections, uh, and I may go back to that in a minute, to, to, to the, the questions that you can actually go over uh, when you're studying. Now, that is slightly out of date, I'm sorry, with years, because uh, I haven't been teaching for a few years now, so I can't always get the old papers to put in the um, sections. So but there's still plenty for you to to learn from. Okay, so that's the ocean and the atmosphere. And the next one which follows on is actually cycles. Um, 
just going to close a few things down. Okay, so water carbon rock cycles. Uh, I've mentioned most of this. These integrate important processes within the Earth system. Learn, revise in these in association with relevant geological, oceanic, and atmospheric principles, plus any relevant biology processes. You might find it useful to learn each cycle separately, but then actually see how they intersect. So, for example, the water and the carbon cycle obviously intersects where any water is involved. Um, the carbon cycle and the and the G and the rock cycle correspond because there is something called the deep carbon cycle, which is where um, carbon is sequestered in the bottom of the ocean and then goes um, very deep into the kind of the the Earth's crust and carbon can be locked away for sort of literally millions of years. That is obviously, there is obviously a relationship between the carbon cycle and the rock cycle there. So make sure that you're actually understanding that. And again, go over practice questions and I can't emphasise enough how important that is. Now, nature of science, and then I'm going to actually go over this. And this section gives you practice on nature and science aspects, particularly how Earth and space scientists gather evidence. Now, I do use a context for this, and this is um, this is on the Alpine Fault. And the example used is a research done by geologists to determine how often the Alpine Fault moves or ruptures, which is about every 300 years, plus or minus kind of 30 to 50 years. And the last one happened in 1717, so we're starting to be overdue for one, which is an interesting thing to think about. And so this, this is going to show you some of the tools that scientists use to observe important aspects and processes. It's also going to show you the difference between relative dating and absolute dating and um, some of the technology they are using, um, environmental conditions that they have to work under. Why did they choose that research site, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is also a folder with practice questions in them that access aspects of nature of science. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here, and I'm going to find the relevant PowerPoint on this Alpine Fault work, and we are going to go over that and have a good look at how scientists are working. Right. Let's go over this. I'm just going to share screen again. Um, and Right, sorry, this is taking a couple of minutes, but it won't be too long. Right, now this is a special um, context. Uh, it's a very good one, but I think because it actually integrates a lot of aspects that you are expected to know to know and be familiar with. Some stuff you may have gone over in class or not, but this gives you a chance to actually learn more about that. So let's actually um, put that, I'm not too sure how to make that full screen because I'm looking on Google now, so we won't worry too much about that. Okay, there must be, I'm not going to spend time searching for that. Okay. Right, so first of all, a little bit about the geological timescale for all of Earth's history. And the geological timescale is something you may or may not have actually heard, of, heard about when you're doing geology. But the Earth has been around for four and a half billion years. So there has been enormous changes. One of the things that is happening is that the surface and underneath the surface of the Earth is actually changing the whole time. And this has been happening for four and a half billion years. And to make sense of that, Geologists have certain divisions. The longest ones are called um, uh, 
eons, and then there are eras and periods and epochs. And you can actually, that is just a subset. You don't need have to know that. This goes back, oh, it goes back to four and a half billion years. And you can see, you know, when the earliest ice age is beginning and ends, um, earliest humans, formation of the Himalayans, dinosaurs, extinction, etc. Uh, during that time, um, life starting from about sort of three and a half billion years again has also evolved and, and tangent, but then we don't do too much about that except recognise the importance of fossils. Uh, so to, because uh, to be realistic, New Zealand is only a small country. This is probably the geological, this is the geological time scale that you need to know. And this actually shows you um, the two eras here, Cenozoic and Mesozoic. Um, the time goes back to actually probably the very first when New Zealand was just, just, just starting to be formed off the, the coast of, of Gondwana land. The, the the big divisions between eras, for example, often happen when there's kind of mass, what's known as mass extinctions, um, to coincide to actually huge changes in geological history, and it often happens with actually mass extinctions of some sort. So you can see that the barrier between Mesozoic and Cenozoic is 65 million years ago, and that was when the asteroid crashed into Earth and hastened or caused the the um, death of the dinosaurs. After that, there are smaller changes that actually happen to uh, have a to to change a period and then to change an epoch. And if you read on the right hand side, uh, dates are found by examining fossils and by radioisotope dating, which I'm going to go into um, we are now in the Holocene and a lot of scientists say that we have now entered the Anthropocene and this is where humans have actually had a massive effect on um, geological history, on shape of geological history to the point where we're getting mass extinctions um, all over again caused by human activity and also um, climate change. You do not need to learn this, but if it actually appeared in a question, and there was one question where it did appear in, and I just can't remember exactly which one it was, uh, you don't need to, you need to, it means that you look at it and you think, oh, I know what that's all about, and you can understand it. Uh, there is a very good question in the very first um, scholarship paper, 2013, I think, or 2014, uh, and it's it's online. It's in one of your in folders with old exams. And there is a question about the Anthropocene. It's interesting to read it and interesting to read the answers because there's is not um, one of the key things, of course, with Anthropocene is you've got a layer of plastic. So geologists in the future will dig down into the ground and see that layer of plastic. Mm. There's also going to be things like aluminium because aluminium does not just happen in the ground like um, copper or or gold or silver. You have to extract it, and there's aluminium all over the world, so therefore that implies it's been extracted. Uh, there's also really interesting things like cats and dogs everywhere, whereas usually in the evolution of, a, of um, animals, particularly land-based animals, they stay. They tend to stay in the area where they evolved and maybe spread out a bit, but not worldwide. So there's all sorts of indications. Plants are another one. You get um, plants all over the world now, and the, the 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 lupin that you see down in the South Island is often mentioned because you also see that in many other parts, similar parts of the world. And so that's an interesting question to just read over. Okay, uh, so we're going to go over, and one of course is the um, one of the things is that. Um, any long straight line seen on Earth is always a fault line. And and have a look at how straight the Alpine fault is going down the west coast. 
And I asked a question of um, some students yesterday when I was doing question and answer section. What would, what does this line of snow indicate? And it's not only actually showing the, the Alpine Fault, but it's also showing that the Southern Alps are to the east or to the right-hand side of the Alpine Fault. And that's an important tectonic. The Southern Alps are a tectonic feature, just the same as the volcanoes are. And so it's important to realise that the Southern Alps, uh, they are uplifted every time there is actually an Alpine Fault earthquake, not by very much, but just by a couple of metres. They're also uplifted by uh, the, the fact that the Pacific Plate, the continental crust of the Pacific Plate, is overriding the continental crust of the Australian. And the Southern Alps would be something like 24 kilometres high if um, it wasn't actually for erosion and weathering. Okay, and just be aware that any long straight line seen on Earth, uh, and if you see a long straight line on Mars, it's a tectonic, um, it's a tectonic, gash. However, to just to give another astronomy reference, if you see a straight line on, say, Enceladus or um, Europa, which are covered in ice, a long straight line there is liable to be a crack in the ice. Um, okay, let's keep going. Right, the Alpine fault can be easily seen in satellite photos and so can other faults, and this is showing the twisting that goes on in the middle of the um, top of the south and the bottom of the North Island where there's a lot of major fault lines. And this is due to the fact that the, the Pacific Plate is subducting under the Australian Plate in the North Island, but the Australian is subducting under the Pacific at the bottom of the South Island, something you also should know and be aware of kind of the twisting motion that, that, that New Zealand is subjected to. Okay. Now, another way where um, that geologists find out evidence and I often say that geology is a bit like the greatest detective story because just as in a crime thing you get a bit of evidence there and a bit of evidence there and a bit of evidence there and you actually have to put them together and in this case and I'm just going to go to the next slide the two the two geologists that stomp the whole length of the um, practically the whole length of the north of the South Island discovered the Alpine Fault, they discovered all sorts of things, but what they particularly also saw was way up in the Nelson St. Arnold area, a, a section of rock which is shown here by the screen, um, and the rest of that rock they didn't actually find anywhere along here until they got down to the bottom of the South Island. And when this was actually taken to international conferences, this was when the world the world of um, earth scientists and geologists finally realised that tectonic plate theory was a theory. And that wasn't sort of that long ago. And funnily enough, it was in my lifetime. Um, okay, and if I go back to the previous uh, one, here it is, that blue strip there. It's particularly that blue strip of, of um, a rock called dunite. And the rest of it, you can actually see down here. And so to map rocks, and in here, what's known as the basement rocks of New Zealand are mapped. So if you stripped away all the kind of surface stuff, this is the basement rock. And uh, when this is actually mapped, you can actually see, as shown in the next slide, that these two bits of rock actually used to join up. And so there has been this phenomenal movement along the Alpine Fault, over 480 kilometres that has been moved, and it's been moved over about, oh, I forget the exact time, 20 to 40 million years. It has moved that much. Okay, no, it might be less than that. I'm sorry, I don't have that on top of my head. Okay, and this shows what these rocks look like. So this is up the back of Nelson, and this type of rock, you can't actually grow a lot of vegetation on it, only very scrubby vegetation. It's quite got a quite reddish colour because it's manganese-rich. And the rest of it is way down south. Jackson's Bay, if you know your New Zealand geography, which is right at the start of the top of Fjordland, the north of Fjordland. Okay, so that, that's where observation has been especially used. And observ um, you, Google Images these days is fantastic. If you go onto Google Earth, you can actually follow the, uh, the line of the Alpine Fault. 
there actually is the piece of rock in St. Arnold that um, links up with more of the Nunite, which you can't very easily see, only little snatches of it above, but you can actually see this rock, and it's quite amazing when you're actually there to think that the rest of it is 480 kilometres away. Uh, and here is you can actually carry on seeing this all the way down, and there it is running through um, particularly mountainous area, and there's your um, there's Jackson's Bay there, and there's your the rest of that rock, Dunite, and then here it is coming out to sea. So now notice that this has actually probably been taken from a plane. These days drones are used and also satellite images to give scientists information that they never used to have. Okay. Now this is also showing some some evidence of where you can show alpine fault movement. And this is this is actually kind of part of relative dating. So where you get a sense of dating relative to one another, but you might not know exactly when something happened. If you actually have a look at this black zigzag line, and you can probably see my cursor, it starts with a road that you are going along a road that you drive in to go towards St. Arnold. You then hang a right and you actually get to the lake itself. Now those two lines that are parallel to each other used to be one one um, valley, and possibly it had water in it, I don't know. So that used to be one valley. So there has been movement along the Alpine Fault to create that um, the chain, that sort of pattern where the lake's quite separated now from the valley the road comes in. Uh, and that would have actually happened probably over thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Also in this picture, you can actually see a stream, which has got a bit of a dog leg in it. And that's probably showing about two, um, two to three alpine fault movements. And this is what um, Wellam, who is one of the scientists um, going, down the east coast, going down the west coast, that is what one of the things they noticed was a number of times there was offset rivers. And so that was one bit of evidence, and there's another. And that is evidence of horizontal movement. Also in this area, you can actually see evidence of vertical movement. And this fault scarp just goes on for a long, you can drive along sort of quite a straight road for quite a long period of time, and you can see this fault, this fault scarp moving along. And this is showing probably about um, probably showing about eight eight-ish sort of eight to twelve movements maybe of the Alpine fault showing vertical movement. And this one down here, quite Fun, which is, I mean, that is actually, uh, this is actually uh, corrugated iron statues of, and I can't remember whether it's cows or horses, I can never remember, but it does actually show two uplifts of, of the Alpine Fault, so that's a smaller one. This is a very glacial area, so previous records of Alpine Fault movement has often been covered by um, moraine from glaciers um, melting and that sort of thing. And so there would have been probably some moraine there that and happening not too long ago, and then that shows two movements of the Alpine Fault. And then there's also a phenomenon called river terraces, which is formed by rivers wearing down through land. And the, the best fun thing that can actually happen with terraces, and you've got a beautiful example of that in Wellington, is that if you look at the bottom diagram first, you can actually see where one river terrace is has been offset, and you can see it in other parts of the diagram too, but that's particularly visible. And you can see the fault line. There's your straight line going right through these terraces, and they are offset. So you can notice how it shows actually three offsets here. They're offset vertically and horizontally. And the one closest to the river, which is going to be down the bottom here, is offset less than the ones further away. And so obviously the one nearest to the river is, is, is because of less alpine fault movements than the, the 
the ones further away. And from this, you can you can pretty well work out how much the Alpine fault actually moves each time there's a major movement. And it's it's quite a lot. It's sort of about 12, it possibly even more um, metres in, in horizontal movement. And it's showing the, the relatively small vertical movement as well. But Okay. Now, the rock cycle you should have um, hopefully learnt by now. Geologists need to study the rocks. They need to be able to they tell important stories. There's resources online you can read. There are three main types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Um, they can change into each other by various processes that you need to be aware of. Plate tectonic movements recycles rock material as one of the driving forces of the rock cycle. The sun is responsible for driving wind and ocean currents, which contributes towards the weathering and erosion of rocks. It's quite good if you're kind of a bit mixed up about sedimentary rocks to actually start, I'm sorry, the rock cycle, to start by learning about sedimentary rocks because what creates sedimentary rocks is like the sand when we're walking along a beach. We can feel sand. And it's very easy to feel sandstone, which is the what old sandstone, if it is compressed and buried and subjected to time, ends up with this kind of rock that you can feel is sort of gritty and grainy. If you go for a walk in silt and you've got shoes on and, you, and your shoes stick and they often come off your foot as you're pulling your foot up, that, when that becomes solidified, is siltstone. And you can feel the sort of smooth, the smoothness of the siltstone, which is quite different from the, um, the the grittiness of the sandstone. And so that is a really good place to start, is sedimentary rock, because it's something you can see and relate to. And often what you're seeing around the countryside is, um, is sedimentary rock. That, of course, can get buried very deeply and then get changed to metamorphic rock. And there's some good pictures of those changes in the relevant folder. That can get melted and form, um, form magma and sedimentary rock can also get melted and form magma and magma and form igneous rock. Okay, I don't have time to go into too much into detail. In this, there are very good resources in the relevant folders. Okay, so let's carry on here. Now, I've been talking a lot about relative dating. Now, this is a clay cliffs near Omarama, or, or, or it's sometimes called Omarama, but I think more correctly it's Omarama, made up of layers of sandstone, gravel, and silt. So something that is very easily related to. It's all come down with rivers. So there's been different types of rivers. When you actually have got these sort of pale grey bands, they tend to be very, um, um, feel more like silt, very fine grain. That means that there was a very calm time in the river when that sediment actually got deposited in the bottom of the rivers. Uh, if you have a look at some of the stuff that's got lots of rocks sticking out, there was obviously massive floods at that time, which actually brought down a whole lot of rocks. And that becomes solidified and forms a conglomerate rock. And then in between, you're going to get your sandstone, was where the river was a bit active, but, but not at the point where it was bringing down masses of sort of flood material. So by looking at those different layers, which are actually called strata, and the study of these layers is called stratigraphy, uh, you can get an idea of actually the, the the story of the rivers and possibly the lakes in that area from studying this. Now, there's some important points here. This is possibly tilted a little bit, but it is still an intact record of different layers of geological history. So the bottom layer is always going to be the oldest when you get something that's pretty flat and straight like that. The top is always going to be the youngest, okay? That's a really important point. Okay, the rock has to be massively altered, um, tilted and even turned upside down to have that not true. Right, relative dating, important points. Uh, sediments are formed by weathering and erosion of rocks. 
uh, and they also will will capture um, once living organisms as well. And so in those very rubbly layers, particularly where there was floods, you would possibly be able to find fossils that you can identify. Sediments are deposited in flat horizontal layers, each layer extending for a long way in all directions. Um, sometimes volcanic rock will rise through the layers and sometimes you'll get faults crossing through it. But we're particularly concerned with what, um, and there has been questions of them, what you are finding when there are very regular layers. And often how that is determined is by scientists taking sediment cores. And there has been at least two questions, I think, on sediment cores. And so it is worth actually knowing about this type of stratigraphy and how that relates to a sediment core. And I'll be doing more of that as we go on. All right, this is actually showing some strata that has actually been tilted. And you can see in the top photo how the, um, the there has been offset. And you can see some offset between, uh, between, say, this layer here. And then further up, you can see the rest of it up there. Okay, um, and then that... Um, below you've actually got some rock that obviously isn't quite so brittle as the one at the top and it means it can actually be folded and there you're not even too too sure you have to use special techniques to make sure you're finding either the oldest or the youngest there yeah, you can't just tell by just looking by it and assume with the one above um, um, you can actually assume that the one on the bottom right hand corner is the oldest and the the, the, the one at the top is the youngest um, but geologists will always just check and make sure that they've got that right. Okay, and the way they actually check is when you've got different layers, what you're actually hoping for is something pretty easy, like maybe a wormhole, evidence of where a worm has burrowed down, and then you definitely know that that part of the strata is the top because the worm will have burrow burrowed down from kind of the you know, the bottom of the, the sea or the ocean or wherever it was. And so, therefore, that must be the youngest and everything else the oldest. This is also showing how particles are deposited and the coarse ones are always deposited first and the finer ones next. So, therefore, you can tell that this is the oldest part of the strata and this is the youngest. And here is back to the Alpine Fault story. Here is this wonderful um, cliff. Um, showing a whole lot of strata in a cliff, which is a fault scarp at Hokuri Creek in southwestland. And this has actually got a record of 6,000 years of alpine faults. And look, the oldest is at the bottom. You're not actually seeing the oldest, but there's one that's 4,500 BC. And the youngest are actually up at the top. Oh, no, 4,000 BC is probably is the oldest, actually. Right, and, so, and then the youngest is actually um, up at the top. So, and they, and what actually happens here is that when there is a normal year and there, this is looking at, this is a record of kind of what's been happening in the river. When you get a river running in the normal way, what you're going to get is kind of all sorts of organic material coming down and you're going to get layers of, of peat and that sort of thing. Um, um, sorry, I just lost my thought a minute. Um, you're going to get layers of peat, and and that is going to be a time that is in between um, earthquakes. And then when you get the the uh, the paler colour, that is when there has actually been an earthquake, and and um, earthquake debris has actually covered the peat. So you actually get these different layers and scientists can actually um, look at these and look at these and actually determine uh, the number of earthquakes that there has actually been. So this was this massive great record that got discovered where they are able to look at these different kind of layers and actually see just how many earthquakes there has been. And they didn't have the first... They didn't have the top 2,000 years, and the reason is that there had been actually erosion off the top. Uh, so 
um, to do that, and here's a very good blog that you can actually go to. Uh, yes, it was, four, sorry, 4,000 years. Um, no, that's right. 2,000 to 4,000 years, and then they managed to get, sorry, I'm burbling, but now I will just stop. Let's go back to the Hukuri Creek. There you can actually see the, the displacement in the river, where the river's been displaced by relatively recent earthquakes. But the study area is a fault scarp that is, um, hasn't been damaged too much by earth movement and is able to show that, that um, wonderful record. Uh, and about six, a record of about 6,000 years. And then the the next 2,000 years was able to be found by using sediment cores on an area that was actually south of uh, of the Hukuri um, Creek, and they were able to get the other 2,000 years. And so from that, they were able to get, by using radiocarbon dating, and I'm going to go over radiocarbon dating in a while, by getting right by going over um, by radiocarbon dating, which is used for dating things like leaves and small small critters, small animals, things like that. You can see that there is a pretty regular kind of thing going on with these earthquakes, and it has alpine fault has been has been rupturing in a very regular cycle over the last eight thousand years. The average is 3,030 years of the most common actual interval between the Alpine Fault being 300 years. The last rupture was in 717. Okay. Now, we're still looking at, if we actually can remember, uh, if Sorry, if we go back to this slide just very quickly, you can see how you've got the different layers, and this is still relative dating. Like we know the bottom one is oldest relative to the top one. If you want to actually get what's known as an absolute dating, there are different ways of doing this, but one of them is to actually find fossils, which is what I'm next going to go over. And the another way is actually by something called carbon-14 dating, which I'm going to go over a bit more in a minute. Uh, okay, so fossils. So fossils are uh, is organic material, plants or animals that, when sedimentary rock is formed, and fossils are only formed in sedimentary rock, and you don't see fossils in igneous or metamorphic rock because they've been subjected to too much heat um, and too much, you know, just just um, action under the ground. So when you are, um, so the fossils get trapped in sedimentary rock, and you look in sedimentary rock for fossil evidence, and there are. Not everything gets fossilised. You need to have something that can actually be um, left behind. And fossils can be as massive, as I've said here, as giant leg bones or as small as bacterial pollen grains. And funnily enough, often the smallest things like pollen grains, phytoplankton, are the most important things that um, you can, in terms of determining things like climate and things like that. Now, there, there'll be some fossils called index fossils, and these are if you find a fossil in a certain layer and you don't find it anywhere else and it's a fairly common fossil, then if you can actually find that fossil in a layer that looks similar elsewhere, then you then know you can actually link up those bands of rock. Okay? Now, um, when Willem was linking up the two bands of rock that were 400 um and years ago, he wasn't using fossils then. He was using the distinctive colour of the rocks and minerals that you could actually find in those rocks. But fossils are also really important as well. And fossils also can be quite – another really good use of, a, of an index fossil is one that has only maybe got a narrow temperature range that it grows in so that or a narrow pH range. So if you find that fossil, you know that that was what the climate was like or the conditions that such as the city of the ocean was like 
at that point in time. So index fossils are actually quite important. And they can absolutely da, um, date a, a layer as opposed to just relative dating. So even if you can date one layer, then you get actually um, an idea of what the other la layers might be. And here are fossil plankton. These electron microscope photos show in detail surface of three fossil plankton found in the sediment. And examining and identifying such fossils can give detailed information about past climates and environmental conditions. These are teeny tiny, by the way. This is electron microscope pictures. These are incredibly tiny. And so whenever, um, whenever uh, sediment cores are examined, they usually examine incredibly carefully. Okay, so now we're going to go on to sediment cores. And this actually, I think, featured in an exam question one year. Uh, a sediment core is something where you literally have a kind of cylinder and it gets pushed into a seabed or into a lake bed or even into maybe a river bed and you um, um, coastal coastal places around the coast and you actually bring it up and then you kind of open out the core, open the, um, the cylinder out and you get these these um, different sediment cores. And these are a really important tool for finding about out about all sorts of, of things. So, for example, in the top of the South Island, sediment cores have been used to try and um, find out how often a major fault line in that part of the area breaks. Because if you've got good information about when this is likely to happen, happen you can start to actually inform the people living in the area of, of various risks. This is an interesting sediment core because um, this was taken off the east coast on the continental shelf, four kilometres deep. Oh, no, that's a bit off the continental shelf. Um, the top left is the, is the youngest and the, the bottom is the oldest. So this has obviously been cut off, cut up for the photo. Uh, whenever you actually see the dark marks, that is actually volcanic ash from Taupo eruptions. Um, they're really important because each eruption, each major Taupo eruption has a distinctive chemical makeup. So if you examine these records, you can cross-correlate with what you're actually finding on land. Land, of course, is subjected to a lot of erosion, so the record is going to be imperfect, but these sediment cores also give a record and the ash obviously has fallen down through the water but once it's actually settled it's not subjected to any erosion like on land so therefore these can be excellent ways of cross correlating and important earth and space sciencing cross correlating with what people are actually finding on land so therefore it improves the rigor of the data Okay, the lighter grey areas um, contain fossilised plankton and indicate changes in the ocean over thousands of years. So you can actually find an enormous amount of that. And so someone looking in a certain area might find a certain uh, um, a certain type of phytoplankton, which they know will only grow in a certain temperature range. So even though the sediment core might have been got in what is now uh, say, let's, for example, a relatively cooler part of New Zealand, you, phytoplankton might, might indicate that that area was once actually very, very warm or much, much colder. Okay, let's move on. Now, here is a sediment core that is actually taken from a lake. They're all the way up the Alpine Fault, there are lots of little lakes, and sediment cores have been taken from those lakes to help cross-correlate the data from Hakuri um, Scarp Face and uh, John O'Groats further south. And in this actually shows quite a record. So this actually shows this part here is the messiness from a major earthquake. This is the 50 years after an earthquake when you get a heck of a lot of the landslides and so a lot of terrestrial kind of stuff coming onto the bottom of the lake. And this is when you get quite normal times again. And 
Um, pollen and f- pollen is actually another important thing like phytoplankton. Each plant um, has a unique pollen grain. And so if you if, if you find pollen grains in your sediment cores in certain areas, then that also can tell you a heck of a lot about the climate at that time. And scientists will be looking for special, for, for again, for um, fossil index fossils and index pollen grains that they know is a particular plant that grew in a particular climate and won't grow in any other sort of climate. So therefore that gives you a lot of information about if if you're using this for climate, to find out about climate, about climate. Okay, and this is actually, I won't spend too long on this. That's the messy bit I just showed you. This is diagrammatic. That is the 50 years in between where you've got your lots and lots and lots of landslides, and that is being shown in a picture there. And then you've got the earthquake deposits as well. What was interesting about all this research along these little lakes is they were able to determine how far the alpine fault had ruptured each time, and that diagram in the bottom right actually shows that. Okay, now tree ring or tree ring data or dendrochronology is also, and I've talked a little bit about carbon-14 dating, and I'll talk about that in a wee while. Tree ring data or dendrochronology is another really important of absolute dating. And if you actually, when you've got time, have a really good look at that chart on the right-hand side, um, that actually indicates in that record the different tree rings that indicate different stages in human history. Now, tree rings are usually formed they're formed once a year, sort of in the summer. The, it, it's, it's, a, it's a special ring that is used for um, transporting water, the flow, and, um, and if you have a very good season, it's going to be bigger, and if you have a, a not-so-good season, it's going to be smaller. So you can tell whether there's dry years or wet years. And in, in, in the bottom case, um, where there's a fire scar. What actually happens with an earthquake is that the uh, – Really bad earthquake will actually, um, and this is a tree that obviously stayed alive in the Alpine, last Alpine Pole earthquake, um, it actually shakes the roots. So the roots actually can't absorb so much water. So if you actually look in the middle, you'll see 1717 was the last major earthquake along the Alpine Fault. And so that tree ring, dark, tree ring if we could look more closely than we're able you would be able to actually um, see that there was a difference in that ring, and that's what it actually indicated. Now, that is absolute. That gives you an absolute date because you can literally um, count the rings to that point. Uh, and the photograph on the right, on the left, is actually just to show you what the tree ring started to look like in, in a good way. Right, and just actually showing here is that uh, if you if you've got if you have a whole lot of trees and you have a major shake what's going to happen is some trees are going to fall over so they're going to die and if they're dug up later you will have a tree ring record to the point where there is death of the tree you're going to get violent shaking which is going to disrupt the the roots and that'll show up in the tree ring data or you're going to get new trees and you can see in the bottom one that are actually going to sprout from seed that was already there so the beginning of that is going to be at or close to the the beginning of the tree rings to when the alpine fault was and you can actually get tree ring data and you can overlap it um, and so you can actually go back quite a bit in time um, to actually determine, um, to actually, you can go back actually in New Zealand thousands of years and get an idea of the type of sort of conditions in that area. And it can also give you climate as well, if there's a lot of wet years or a lot of dry years. 
Now, radiometric dating is pretty important. Um, people learn it in physics. You don't need to know it in the detail. That's physics use it, but physics, is, um, radiometric dating is another absolute way of absolute way of dating something. There is usually a bit of an error bar in it. It's not absolutely as exact as um, tree ring data, but then tree ring data only goes back for thousands of years rather than tens of thousands or hundreds or, or millions of years. The most important one that I'd make sure you know about is carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. So this is called carbon dating. And I'll just go over this. Most absolute date for rocks are obtained with methods that use radioactive minerals and clocks and rocks as geological clocks. Now, some elements have different isotopes. So there can be an element that, and carbon is a good example of one, and uranium is another good one, where they all have the same atomic number, so exactly the same number of neutrons and electrons, but a different mass number, which means they have a different number of neutrons. So carbon, for example, can be carbon-12, carbon-13, or carbon-14. Only carbon-14 one is radioactive. And radioactivity means that they spit out a particle, either an alpha or a beta particle, or the very dangerous gamma rays, but we're usually concerned about the alpha and beta, or beta particles. They spit these out. So so, so these isotopes break or spit this out, particles out over time, they radiate decay. And in the process, they become different elements. Each original isotope, the parent, gradually decays to form a new isotope, the daughter. Each isotope is identified by its mass number. Okay, so when uranium-238 decays, for example, it, brings, it produces lead-206. Um, through a number of processes, that is. Carbon-14 um, decays to nitrogen-14, which seems a bit weird, but this is the mass number. The carbon um, atomic number stays the same, and the nitrogen, of course, atomic number stays the same as well. Okay, now carbon-14 is used for dating organic remains and archaeological artefacts, and it's only accurate for 50,000 years old. This is because of something called the half-life. Each radioactive isotope decays at a constant rate that is unique to that isotope. So, for example, if you've got um, 16 grams of carbon-14 and you wait about 5,000 years, that grams of carbon-14 will be reduced to 16, will be reduced to 8. And then if we not, and there will be another kind of just over 5,000 years before it decays to become um, 16, 8, 8, and then 4, and then 2, and then 1. So, and that, and so the rates of decay are known. So, if the proportion of parent and daughter isotopes and rocks are known, the time when the rocks are formed can be calculated, or the time when the leaf grew, or the piece of clay pot was made or the uh, um, the phytoplankton actually lived. Okay, so carbon-14 is a really important for getting um, relative dating because its half-life is only just over 5,000 years. That means that it uh, is only really accurate to about 50 or 60,000 years. After that, it stops being accurate, so you don't use something else. The two that you need to be aware of, radiometric dating or radioactive dating as well as called, carbon-14, carbon dating, and um, potassium to argon dating, which is what is used for volcanic rocks. And because New Zealand is a young country, we're usually only um, dating um, younger rocks. But it's the same principle, and, of course, it's got um, – it's much, much, much more accurate for over longer periods of time. Okay, so that's radiometric dating, and here's radio – also called radioisotope dating, and this actually shows you um, more about this, and I'll leave that for you to go over yourself. 
Okay, now stable isotopes are quite cool. They don't decay. But, for example, I just mentioned before carbon-12 and um, carbon-13. And what's quite cool about that is that plants selectively take up uh, carbon-12 when they're photosynthesizing. So if you have a lot of plant activity in a certain period of the Earth's history, um, the atmosphere is going to become relatively depleted in carbon-12 relative to carbon-13. That can be measured by actually looking at, and I think I've got a picture here, of um, these tiny little bubbles and ice cores, and you can get a ratio of um, C12 to C13 or oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, and that gives you an idea of the climate at the time. If it's if there's been a lot of kind of photosynthesis going on, then it's obviously a warmer, wetter sort of um, period of time. And these ice cores, while I'm on them, these, these are collected in Antarctica and from glaciers and things like that. And in Antarctica, they even have a very fancy gizmo that as they get the ice core, they put it with the oldest on the bottom and they, they sort of gradually melt it and the machine is able to analyse the isotope ratios as it goes and also the, what else might actually be, which I think is pretty amazing technology. Okay, so, so stable isotopes are pretty cool for being able to find out about climate. Re really useful in climate change um, research. Okay, there's also windborne material. You can actually get that in sediment cores. And, of course, particularly if you've got pollen and windblown pollen, um, then you're going to be able to tell something about plants in that area. Instrument measurements and written or oral records are also really important, and particularly in New Zealand, we talk a lot about whakapapa. Whakapapa is, is, has often got um, really important sort of oral information that can go back quite a long period of time about environmental conditions going through that time. There's also written records. Uh, we only have 150 years of temperature, meteorological, seismological records, but they are very useful, particularly if we're looking at climate data, um, which at the moment we're often um, going back to relatively small amounts of geological time. Okay, and this is just showing you that I've done a lot actually on uh, just on how you find out about um, finding out about the Alpine Fault, but here's Argo floats that can be used for um, oceanographic research, and they are scattered all over the world, and they are sending data to satellites all the time, and that data can be collated, uh, and there's how an Argo float works. There are also buoys in the, um, and I don't actually have a picture here, but there's always buoys that are actually put out in bays, so where I live, there's one out in Tasman Bay, um, Golden Bay, and data can be got off those for, for research as well. Uh, now, this is actually the last bit of this, or the last two slides, I think, of this, and then we're going to have a little bit of a break. Uh, some important terms, baseline data. Baseline data is a set of information that is initially gathered at the beginning of a research project. And any data collected after that can be compared to baseline data. This is often done in earth and space science research to do with climate change, to do with oceanic acidification, measurement of sea ice in Antarctica. And so, for example, those carbon dioxide graphs, hopefully you're all very familiar with the climate change to show that the that the CO2 in the atmosphere has been steadily been growing up for going up for quite a long time now. That is actually forming baseline data. So the base, the very start of that would have been the data right at the beginning. Ideally, it would have been good to have had it right from the the atmosphere before the industrial revolution, but that's not um, wasn't absolute, wasn't possible. But they have now actually been keeping on gathering it. I've got, I know someone who goes down and measures, the, or he and his team goes down and measures the thickness of the sea ice, ice in a certain place in Antarctica every year, or most years, 
um, that also can give you as baseline data for looking to see whether sea ice is getting thicker or thinner. Um, there's all sorts of types of data. I also know someone else who goes and does ocean, ocean acidification data off the coast of Otago. That also is to establish some baseline data from which you can see if there's any change. So really important for earth and space science. Um, data's calibration is also really important. A lot of sort of quite fancy instruments are used in the collection of data in earth and space science research. Sadly, not so much at school, although some of us will have PASCO instruments, but, you know, really kind of fancy gizmos that have been specially designed to do a job. An example of that, though, is the pH, is a pH meter in a school lab, and the school technician will have a solution of exactly 7 um, pH so they can calibrate and make sure that the pH meter is accurately measuring um, 7 pH and calibrating it that way. They may also maybe have a known acid and a known um, alkali or base pH as well that they can also use for calibration. But it is especially important and especially when there's probably just a few scientists around the world, for example, maybe measuring pH changes, it is especially important that the um, that the instruments are calibrated. And I've known of people taking huge, great instruments and putting them in in um, swimming pools. And I think it was in Japan this particular story, and then swimming, um, filling up the swimming pool with um, neutral. Um, pH 7, not pH 7.1, but pH 7, not even pH um, nor, nor one, and, and making sure that instruments actually measured exactly pH 7 and then putting in a, um, a weak um, solution, buffer solution, and making sure that pH was accurately measured. So calibration is an important thing. Also cross-correlation, and I've talked quite a lot about that. And cross-correlation, um, can be just like looking at the different sediment cores from the from the bottom of the Alpine Fault um, compared with those little lakes. Um, but it might also be cross-correlation for different climatic changes or something. Um, um, I was on a research vessel once where they cross-correlated data um, by measuring the thickness of a certain type of fish in a layer in the ocean and the sickness indicated health, and they were able to cross-correlate that with the amount of um, fatty acids that were found in the kind of little fish that they were studying to show that, yes, this was a healthy fish population. So cross-correlation can happen different ways. For example, um, radiocarbon dating um, can be cross-correlated with, with, um, with tree ring data, especially if it's only over a few thousand years. So they're kind of important terms to be aware of. And the last little bit, how do earth and space scientists ensure that data they collect in the field is valid and reliable? Air scientists often can't repeat experiments and often can't re repeat field trips because they cost the most phenomenal amount of money. So they have to make sure that data is is valid and reliable right from the start. So a lot of good scientific um, research will actually go into spending time carefully choosing the site to be studied. And those little lakes all the way up the Alpine Fault, they, there would have been a lot of kind of going and visiting those lakes, even just taking preliminary cores from different parts of the lake to determine which was the best place to actually take a core and which were the best lakes to use all the way up. Um, so, therefore, science isn't just kind of one experiment in a lab for a while. There's a lot more that has to be done. Researching what other scientists have done is important. Make sure their instruments measure accurately and that they are regularly calibrated. Carefully choosing their sample method and resolution, amount of sampling. And one of the questions that I have gone over in the webinars on the different questions actually goes over a sampling sampling that was used to determine um, methane, release of methane that was happening off the east coast of the North Island. And, of course, it's pretty important at the moment that that sort of thing is known about so that we can determine 
whether, um, you know, this is getting worse. So they were also, in their research, it was not only important with resolution, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, but it was also important that they were establishing some baseline data. So this is how many methane seeps we have been able to pick up over, let's say, 100 metres or, or a kilometre at the moment. And resolution is really how they how they actually take their sample. And an, an imperfect but an, exam, an example of that is maybe you've gone on a 100-metre walk from home from school to uh, to home and you've lost a, an important USB stick. It's got a whole lot of notes on it and that um, revision notes or something. So you go back and you start to actually look for your, your USB. Now, you might initially go and just look back every 10 metres, okay? You know, you're in a hurry, you go and look every 10 metres. You don't find your USB stick. So you go back and you start to um, look every metre, okay? And then if you look every metre, you then will find your um, USB stick because you've got your resolution small enough to actually be able to sort of find your USB stick. Now, that's an imperfect example. But that's actually what happened um, in the case. They The first time they went out, they just took a few samples. When they went back a second time, they took a lot more and found a lot more methane seeps. That didn't mean there were more methane seeps. That meant they just had the resolution set at, about, at a, a better resolution, a better sampling method. Um, carefully choose the ways the data is analysed and interpreted, and that's where if you ever go into university and do any of this stuff, you'll need to have some statistics and learn about good statistical methods because data gets, that's when um, a good background in maths is important. Waiting for right atmospheric conditions or weather or time of the year, etc., etc. Working in teams to take advantage of scientists' different skill sets. There may be other ways as, as well. Um, you know, things have to be, instruments have to be clean before they're put in the water so that you don't have something kind of sticking to the side of the instrument that might affect a reading, um, all sorts of other things that you may think of. Okay, now I think we just take a break and come back, let's say, in 10 minutes' time, so just before 5 I've got seven minutes to 12 now if we come back uh, just before 5 to 12. And I will then um, take any questions that there might be and then see what you're wanting to do for the, for the next hour. If you don't have any dark ideas, I will actually go over the climate change. Um, Jenny? Um, uh, yep. The, uh, I've got the time as 18 minutes to 12 just now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got 17. That's all right. So oh, sorry, minutes. I thought you said seven. My bad. No, thank you. I don't know. Yeah. So if we come back at, at say, just before 5 2. Yep. Okay, are there any questions now? Uh, nope, nothing at this stage. Um, okay. Andrew is also here, so I'll probably disappear, and Andrew will uh, thank you at the end. Okay. okay. See you back here at 5 to 12. Okay, right. Bye.
Right, I'm ready when you are. I think we're good to go, Jenny. Um, okay. No questions in the chat so far. Okay. Okay, that's Andrew, is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, um, for the last hour, I'm going to, first of all, I've been talking quite a lot about the questions that I did on, on the webinars, and so I'm go actually going to just show you that folder so that you can... Um, so that you can actually go to it and you can know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to share screen and I'm hoping it actually comes up on the screen. And oh, and despite me carefully find looking for it, and I thought having it, I'll just have to look for it for a minute. Um, here we are. Let's see if that works better. Share screen. Here we go. Right. So one of the folders that um, that is in the scholarship resources is the web zoom and audio recordings. And if you'll have a look at this, you'll see that I've actually done a webinar on every single folder there is, except for the nature of science one, which is what I've effectively done just now. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're kind of frantically cramming for the in the last few days before Friday, then this is where you need to go. You can go to get your resources if you haven't already got access. So if I click on the last folder, purples or on um, webinars, sorry, on previous questions, I was going to say the colour and then I realised you wouldn't see the colour because <laughs> I like colouring my Google folders. Okay. So you can see here actually that uh, there are five, well, I've chosen five kind of what I feel were, were good questions, really good questions that showed you how you need to be able to integrate great knowledge, integrate knowledge from various places. So, for example, you're not just going to get a geology question or just get an ocean question. That's not going to happen. You've got to be able to bring information in from all over the place. So it, it gives you examples of um, questions that show specific stuff. So the ACC monitoring was the, the one I talked a bit about before where you actually needed to know about the Oh, you actually saw the picture of it right at the beginning, and that was how monitoring the speed and the properties of the of different um, levels of the ACC currents and how that can be affected by earthquake activity. So there you had to have some oceanic knowledge, and you also had to actually have some um, earth, some earthquake knowledge as well. And you, you have to keep your wits about you in these questions because often there's actually something in the resource booklet or something like that that whether, as to whether you're actually a, um, a a good student, a scholarship or an outstanding student or not, can just turn on just a, a couple of things that you might not think about. So, for example, that ACC monitoring question, um, and that was a table of earthquakes, of major earthquakes that was actually had in the area where those boys for the um, ACC monitoring were put down. And, and, um, and of course, these earthquakes, some of them were clustered together. And so, and the important thing that um, for students to realise there was the fact that if you've got a bad earthquake followed a year later by another bad earthquake and a year or two later by another bad earthquake, there's going to be an accumulative effect of those earthquakes. If they're 20 years apart, everything's had time to kind of settle back and go back to normal. And so there's often something that you need to pick up, which is kind of the key to sort of kind of you making the next kind of leap of understanding in the question. So have a look for that. The methane hydrates one and gas seeps, that's also about slow-moving 
um, underwater avalanche flows, so not one that's going very quickly and causing a tsunami, but one that's just moving very slowly. And so, therefore, you had to know something about um, methane and why it's so important. You had to know a little bit of geology. You might not have learnt about slow avalanches, but you had to obviously work out that if it's not moving fast, it's not going to cause a tsunami, um, that sort of thing. So, and that also is the one that talks about resolution. Red dwarfs and habitable zones is where it's actually got some level two stuff in it. It's also got some, could there be life on other planets or another exoplanets around other stars, that sort of stuff. But it was a really nice question, this, so it's actually well worth having a look at it. It, it asks whether there could be a water zone and possibly a, a, um, a methane zone further out and which one is most likely to have, have life. And so it was a good question there. The volcanoes and mining actually shows um, – deals with a socio-scientific issue is whether we should be mining the bottom of the oceans for um, what are known as rare earth metals. Uh, these are important because they keep our computers running and our cell phones and our solar panels and all that sort of thing, but how much do we damage pristine environments to for our own benefit? So that was kind of in that as well. And one of the important things about socio-scientific issues is that you don't waffle, is you back it up with the science that you know and um, that sort of thing. And then the warming oceans was a good one showing how if you're actually going to get more heat coming into the planet, it's going to affect ocean circulation and that can then actually affect um, what happens around New Zealand. So that is worth seeing because that's combining your atmosphere and ocean with kind of a little bit of socio-scientific sort of stuff in there. So make sure that you go back over those. Um, I'm just going to go back to, I think it's a look at this folder first it is. Uh, yes, here is the different socio-scientific issues. So that could be used. There's obviously going to be others, but that um, could be used. Now, now notice you're not arguing about whether ocean acidification is a thing or not. You are arguing how we know that there is ocean acidification. The same with climate change, obviously. There's no need to argue about whether there is climate change these days. It's why is it happening and perhaps what we can do to mitigate it. Okay, so that's just some ideas that may be in a topic. And if you've got the Level 3 workbook, then this is in Chapter 3 and that is worth looking at. Um, funnily enough, the skills that you get from some of these internals, the skills of how to write paragraphs and, and coherently put together an answer, are very useful skills for earth and space science. So hopefully if you've done any of these topics, you've got a really good mark and that will actually help you um, in how you express yourself in, in the exam. Okay. Right, so I thought for the last hour we'd actually have a look at the climate change it's climate change is not always done um it's not done badly it's just it's just there isn't time to actually go into it in a lot of a lot of detail so what i'm going to do is go over the the um climate change power pod. i'll just find it i think it's in this one this is one that I actually did with a major signed, signed um, climate change scientist. So there is a little bit of harder stuff in there. Uh, here's a lot of other useful stuff about these cycles. Remember that I said that these cycles are good integrating cycles and you really need to know these cycles. So this is where you'll find them. But let's actually have a look at this one. Now, this has actually got some important points that may not have actually been covered elsewhere and will could also potentially help you as well. So, and of course, it starts with a bit of a sad picture, which is two penguins on top of a melting ice. Not too sure how they exactly got there. Maybe there's a rock behind that they were able to jump on and get up. But it does, we know, the, the classic Northern Hemisphere one, of course, is the polar bear on a nice small ice floe. Okay, and then I wish to also acknowledge um, the scientists that I worked on, worked with. 
Okay, now an important thing of when you're looking at climate change is what's the difference between the climate and the weather. And the fun thing is, put simply, climate tells you what clothes to buy, but weather tells you what clothes to wear. And so climate climate is a long-term thing. Weather is the variable thing, and we've seen that around New Zealand a lot lately. Very, very variable weather. Sometimes wonder whether summer's ever coming, and we sometimes think we're right back in winter, and that can just be in one day. So weather is the short-term atmospheric conditions at a particular time and place, e.g. Wind, cold, windy, rainy in Wellington today. Climate is the average weather for a city, country, or a whole planet over years. And it is climate change we are talking about, not weather change. Weather variability or an increase in variability or extremes of weather are, of course, indicators of long-term climate change. Now, notice that there is natural variation. It is really important to know that there is natural variation. It can vary over years with natural cycles and events. El Nino, La Nina cycles, um, climate varies over years with, say, El Nino, La Nina, which we all know about, or volcanic eruption. So that eruption in Tonga, um, I don't think it's terribly affected our climate, but we're certainly still getting the ash up in the atmosphere affecting sunsets at night. So, and when I was younger, there was a mountain called Mount Pinatubu, who definitely gave us two very cold winters um, in New Zealand um, because so much um, ash had gone up into the stratosphere where they're staying. If ash stays in the troposphere where it is, very easily cleared away, you won't get any long-term effects of volcanoes. But if it actually goes up into the stratosphere, the next layer, then you can actually it can stay up there for ages and have an effect on our weather that can last for a few years. But you also get changes over decades to thousands of years um, that can be um, can happen from both natural and human activity. And there are some solar cycles and slight changes in the tilt of the Earth's axis and that sort of thing that can actually affect. But the climate change models, which are hugely complicated and very, very um, well-known modelling using computers, they always factor in those natural variations. In the, into their climate model. So that that is allowed for in the climate model. Um, okay. Right, carrying on. So naturally over millennium as a result of changes of energy from the sun, changes in the blanket of greenhouse gases, and that naturally can occur from sometimes the Earth will have massive volcanic eruptions that will that will put massive amounts of gas. And, and that happened around about 65 million go, years ago, around about the time of the asteroid crashing into the planet. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it put an enormous amount of lava over a large amount of India. Um, changes in the Earth's orbit and tilt of its axis, and that affects the amount of solar energy raising the Earth. Absorbent of heat by the ocean which is about 90%, and at the moment we would be, if it wasn't for the ocean absorbing so much heat, we would actually be in a much more dire position than we are now. Tectonic plate movement can cause changes in ocean circulation, mountain building and volcanic activity. And that's something, now I now I gen, genuinely do not know what's in the paper, but that is an interesting thing to think about in terms of a, of a um of a scholarship question, because if you have a change in tectonic plate movement, which causes, say, for example, sea force spreading and the Pacific Ocean gets bigger, or an increase in subduction or more subduction where you get the Pacific Ocean gets smaller, that is actually going to affect ocean circulation. And it could affect major surface currents, and it also could affect the Antarctic circumpolar current as well. So that is actually um, something that could happen. But these are all happening over millennia or millions of years, so long time changes. Climate has cooled naturally over the last 50 million years and varied in in 100,000 year warm cold cycles, which are the ice ages, over the last million years. So over 
50 million years there's been a 13 degree variation and over and in ice ages there's a five degree variation but that was enough you know to actually when the temperature really dropped was actually to cover large parts of the planet including large parts of New Zealand with sheets of ice and then foot and melt um, and sea level rise to happen. However, there is very strong evidence that the 1% warming of the last 100 years can't be explained just by natural causes. And the interesting reason is because we all know about the burning of fossil fuels. But do you remember me talking about the carbon, um, how cool I thought stable isotopes were, carbon-12, carbon-13, um, the that that when there was a lot of photosynthesis, carbon-12 was selectively taken out of the atmosphere, so there was less um, relative to carbon-13 than when there wasn't a large amount of photosynthesis happening. So fossil, a lot of fossil fuels um, are, are plant-based, and they must have been buried when there was a large amount of photosynthesis going on. So the burning of fossil fuels has actually put extra carbon-12 into the atmosphere more than would be expected. And so that is one of the ways that they know that the evidence um, that the um, the planet is actually warming and, and it is warming because of, of the um, activities of humans. Okay, apparently there's a slide further on where more of that is, is discussed. Okay, so hang on, just get rid of that. Oh, sorry. No. Okay, so some of the evidence for climate change and cli and global warming. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to get this done within the hour, but increasing temperatures, and that has been seen. The Earth has warmed by about one degree Celsius. Seems weird that one just one degree can have such an effect. We're within a day, we can sometimes have, you know, 10 to 20 degrees variation in temperature, and we managed it, but that's averaged out over the whole planet, and um, and that that is is not good. Uh, mostly in the last four decades, oceans have also warmed by absorbing 90% of the sun's heat. Changes in rainfall, rainfall patterns are happening across the globe, which is going to have immense um, effects on agriculture and also changes between in seasons. Changes in nature with growing seasons lengthening or maybe shortening in some areas. Also, I think there's also a lot of food chains being disrupted. So if you've got a really stable food chain or food web, whether it's the ocean or on land, if one animal is a little bit sensitive to um, temperature changes, it may kind of not be in that food web anymore, and that might be a crucial animal for that food web going on. So, for example, krill. If you had krill in the ocean, if they suddenly could not go where they go and where whales eat them, then you could actually end up with a major disruption in, in an important food chain. Sea level rises, and it's this is because thermal expansion and melting glacier ice that has been on the land, and there's more about that in a minute. And glaciers all over the world are retreating. Most of them are retreating. Okay. And polar ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica store water, equivalent to 7 to 57 metres of sea level rise. So Greenland has got about 7 metres. Antarctica has got 57 metres of sea level rise. That's unthinkable, really. And they are starting to lose mass. Um, okay. What is causing climate change? And this is a really important thing about greenhouse gases. Now, there's actually um, four greenhouse gases actually shown here. The main ones you need to know about are carbon dioxide and methane. Carbon dioxide, an intimate part of the of the um, of the carbon cycle, it is also released naturally but also released from burning fossil fuels. We need some carbon dioxide because it actually does help to warm the planet up to a kind of stable, nice temperature, but we don't want too much of it, which is what is happening. Methane, very important to New Zealand because it's released a lot from um, agriculture, particularly cows. 
released naturally by decomposition in swamps and leakage from fossil fuel extraction, plus other things. And my carbon cycle PowerPoint actually shows you a lot of the other things. So you need to know about methane. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It's worse than carbon dioxide when it gets into the atmosphere. The only good news is that it's short-lived, only stays about 20 years in the atmosphere, but it then actually breaks down or interreacts to actually form carbon dioxide. So you still end up with carbon dioxide. Water vapour is a greenhouse gas, but water vapour is everywhere. Warmer area carries more water vapour. Water, water vapour just makes worse warming from other greenhouse gases. So you can't, um, it's the main thing is to learn about is the effects of carbon dioxide and for methane. Now, let's find out what's normal natural greenhouse effect. There is a normal greenhouse effect. What we are creating on planet Earth is something called the enhanced greenhouse effect. But the normal greenhouse effect is that we do need enough carbon dioxide in our atmosphere to um, warm the Earth to a comfortable average plus 15 degrees Celsius. Now, you often hear, hear carbon dioxide described as a blanket around the Earth. That is just a useful term. Obviously, you can't see it. Carbon dioxide is a relatively dense gas, as you probably know from seeing um, um, dry ice sublimate and, and the gas kind of flowing down over a stage or a lab bench and down onto the floor. Uh, so most of the carbon dioxide is in, in the lower troposphere of, of the atmosphere. Um, so that is natural, that is normal, that is natural. Now, this is where you really have to remember that it's long wave, that sunlight, the energy from sunlight is is as sh short wave radiation. That is absorbed by the surface of the earth, whether it's water or whether it's land, and then it's re-emitted, re-radiated um, re out as infrared Long wave infrared radiation. The long wave um, infrared radiation, if you have you remembered your troposphere studies, that is what actually warms our planet. It's not what we feel when we're walking out in the sun and we feel hot, but it is what actually warms our planet is the infrared that has been given off by the planet, being emitted by the by the Earth. Most escapes out to outer space, allowing Earth to cool, but some infrared radiation is trapped in the air, including CO2, keeping the Earth warm enough to sustain life. So we wouldn't have had the amount of life on our planet without carbon dioxide or without a certain amount of carbon dioxide because we just couldn't have actually warmed the planet enough for essential um, biochemical reactions to happen. So there's some important things to learn in that, particularly the, sh the, the short wave becoming long wave, and it's the long wave that you have to remember about, um, and also that there is a normal, and that's the normal. Here's just another um, diagram uh, saying pretty much the same thing, but it's often good to have two different diagrams to look at just in case you don't get one of them. Okay, so if greenhouse gases are normal, what's going wrong? So um, we're adding extra CO2 and CO4, nitrous oxide. Synthetic greenhouse gases are also being added, such as CFCs. Now, CFCs are also responsible to depleting ozone in the stratosphere. But when they're in the troposphere, they're a greenhouse gas. And a little bit later, I'm going to show you the difference between ozone hole and climate change because that can cause some confusion. Okay, these greenhouse gases rise as fossil fuel usage increases. And remember that I've said that this can be one of the proofs of this is the, is the amount of, um, of um, C12 in the atmosphere. Right. Um, humans have interfered with the carbon cycle by burning forests, lands, mining, burning coal, and have moved carbon from solid storage, which is your coal and oil and that sort of thing, to its gaseous state. Okay. 
And, of course, we know that there's extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because some very amazing people and one amazing person in New Zealand has gone and religiously taken atmospheric measurements over a long period of time. So the ones in, um, in Hawaii started in 1960 to 2010 and at Bering Head, which is off Wellington, from 1970 to 2000, and this goes as far as 2005, but these are still being taken. And these these sites have been chosen because they get um, wind coming off the sea, so any CO2 that is actually being produced by factories that might be relatively nearby or a lot of car exhaust or whatever, that means that that is not... The wind is not it's not taken when the wind is coming in that direction. It's taken when the, the fresh air is kind of howling off the Southern Ocean in the terms of Bering Head and off the Pacific Ocean in the terms of um, up around Hawaii. I think there's one or two other places around the world where these sorts of kind of this sort of data is being collected, but this is incredibly important. And, of course, the Bering Head data was able to cross-correlate the um, atmospheric data in Hawaii. Uh, okay, and other consequences, if um, there's a graph on the left, top left, showing a rise in CO2 plus a rise in CO2 in the ocean and the resulting reduction in pH. Remember, the pH is, it's only what seems to be a minute reduction in, um, in pH, but in actual fact, when you're looking at the amount of hydrogen ions that there is in that very tiny reduction that can have an amazing effect, a huge effect on living creatures and their ability to create particularly calcium carbonate structures. So with, with ocean acidification, you only need a small, um, a small change in pH for that to be a real problem. Okay, now don't get too freaked out from the bottom one, but that's the amount of oxygen is decreasing, but that's only by a minute amount. We don't have to worry about that. Um, but so um, it, it, because if there's an increase in um, CO2, then proportionally there's um, less CO2, less oxygen in the atmosphere. And then the amount of methane is going up too. I don't know why it sort of levels off. Um, maybe there's been a change in agriculture in that area or something. I don't know. Okay. Right, now, what's the enhanced greenhouse gas? This means that more heat is absorbed and re-emitted. Now, this is more heat in the form of that long-wave radiation that is being re-radiated out from the planet Earth, whether it's the water, which is rather more slowly, or whether from the land, which is more quickly. It's that heat. It's not the solar radiation. Okay. Now, here's where the, the scientist came in, and his name was Peter Barrett. I'd temporarily forgotten it before, but I want to acknowledge him. Um, you may not understand it, and I'm not too sure I understand it, but the increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increases its effective radiating level. Okay. Since the fall in temperature with increasing height in the atmosphere is constant and the temperature at the ERL is constant, the temperature of the surface of the Earth rises as greenhouse gases increases. This is the enhanced greenhouse effect. If you don't understand that last paragraph, there's no way you have to learn it, but by, you must know that it's the long wave radiation, that more heat coming in from the sun being changed along um, Long wave radiation re radiated is, is um, captured by that increased amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You can call it a blanket if you want to, but don't use too many colloquial terms unless you've defined that colloquial term somewhere in your answer. Okay. Uh, right. And then this is a fairly complicated diagram, but it shows that. Um, the amount of emissions from so CO the increase it broken down into CO two um, methane fluorine gases are the one like the CFCs right this actually shown that the climate change effects are very interrelated and are very hard to exactly work out so paradoxically 
Britain, which enjoys a relatively mild climate as compared to, say, Canada, which is on the same latitude. They've got a much warmer, Britain's got a much warmer climate. If the Gulf, but because it is warmed by the Gulf Stream, which is part of the, a part of the thermohaline current, and also part of the local surface currents, um, that is becoming that is there's evidence that that's slowing down. If that warp doesn't get to Britain anymore, then Britain is going to be a lot lot colder. So paradoxically, climate change can also cause effects that seem to be counterintuitive. So, for example, Britain getting colder when you'd think it would be getting warmer. Uh, and I might add that there's a heck of a lot more, um, there's a heck of a lot more uh, places getting warmer than there are getting cooler. And so in India, you've got people having to work out in the fields during the day and up to like 60 degrees um, Celsius of heat. And this is causing huge problems for those people um, so increased temperatures are not good but it is a very complex complex interactions and this is kind of showing it so I'd sort of go over this and understand it maybe learn a couple of the connections the ones that you understand warmer oceans stronger storms for example warmer oceans rising sea levels um, is some is, is a connection that you could understand so something that's that relates to your reading and what you've learned to make sure you know those connections quite well. Now, this is an important one. Why are sea level rising, levels rising? And there's two main reasons. And, right, the two main causes are thermal expansion causing by the warming of the oceans. Now, that's that sensible heat. You know there's a difference between latent heat and sensible heat. If you've got water in a pot, um, if you've melted ice it, um, and it's become liquid, that's a change in latent heat. But sensible heat is the warming up of that liquid, so it's not actually changing state for quite a long period of time. But it is actually expanding. If you had a measure on the, the side, it is that because the molecules are getting further apart with the um, increased heat until actually they start to escape and become water vapour. So thermal expansion on a global scale causes a rise in sea level. And uh, and one interesting aspect in the area I live in, in Nelson, there are parts of New Zealand that are actually sinking. <coughs> parts of New Zealand are actually ri rising for completely geological reasons, not human reasons, but geological reasons. And um, But that does mean that if we uh, land is sinking, very slowly but sinking, then any sea level rise is going to be amplified because the land is sinking. Right, two major causes. Also, the loss of land-based ice. That's really important you remember, land-based ice, due to increased melting. Um, so I've got thermal expansion, yes. When water heats up, it expands. Warmer oceans occupy more space. Sea level rise. S sea ice melting, no. This doesn't make the sea level rise. This is because it's already floating in the ocean. Take a glass of ice water, as it warms, the ice in the glass melts, but the total volume of the water does not change. Okay. Whereas if ice on land melts, the total volume. So sea level rise occurs because of an increase in volume and an increase in thermal expansion. Okay. Albedo is important. Albedo we've talked about particularly with astronomy. It's a measure of a reflectivity of a surface. Perfectly white, albedo one, zero. Um, perfectly black, absorbing surface is an albedo of zero. And white, of course, is a reflecting surface. Um, we have a lot of ice covering, particularly the poles of our planets, but also very high mountains and that sort of thing. If that ice melts, um, at the moment, that ice actually reflects part of the sunlight back again. So the short wave radiation is actually reflected back out into space. Okay? Very little is actually absorbed by ice. If you've, however, got an ocean, it may not be a perfectly black absorbing surface, but it is certainly not ice. And that can actually absorb a lot of heat. And so that that's partly where a lot of the heat um, that the ocean is absorbing a lot of the extra heat at the moment, and 90% of the extra heat. That's because it is 
some of it is not able to be reflected back anymore. Okay, here's another climate system is influenced by many factors making it complicated to understand and difficult to work out exactly. You can also get feedbacks in climate system having when these um, factors interact with each other. Positive feedbacks increase temperature, negative feedbacks decrease temperature. It's a little, little bit counterintuitive, but so kind of just learn it. Climate change scientists gain even. Ah, I will forget about that for a minute. I'll just have a look at this slide. I'm just looking at the time. We're all right for time. Uh, having a look at this slide, you can actually see a reaction here between, say, changes in plate tectonics and um, changes in land surface, for example, and also changes in ocean basins, that sort of thing I've been talking about. Changes in the Earth's orbit can affect it, changes in the sun's strength. So. Climate change can be affected by many factors, but remember that climate modelers and scientists understand that and they factor that in. And there is good evidence that the changes are being made by the burning of fossil fuels as a primary one. Right, climate change gain evidence of the effects of change by looking back into the past. Earth's climate has changed before. Evidence comes from many sources, and I'm not going to read through all of this, but ice cores we've discussed, fossil pollen we discussed today, lake sediments we discussed, ocean sediments we discussed, windborne material we discussed, glaciers, tree ring width we've discussed, instrument measurements and written or oral records, which I also discussed. So there are many ways evidence can come from many sources as well as for um, shorter period of climatic changes, um, whakapapa and indigenous knowledge is, can be really important. You won't get a um, question on any of that, I would imagine, in the scholarship exam, but a sibling of yours who does a scholarship exam in the future might. Okay, now this is an important thing, and I've, I've been surprised, even kind of science teachers have come up to me sometimes and said, um, and have got completely mixed up between the depletion of the ozone layer and, and climate change. And first of all, let's actually go over what ozone layer is. It's not something that you might have learned at actually level three, but hopefully if you've actually looked in, in my resources online, I deliberately put back the ozone layer. The ozone layer is an important region in the stratosphere and a high concentration of ozone means that there's just more molecules of ozone in that layer. The, um, the chemical formula for ozone is O3 and ozone is created when high energy UV strikes a normal oxygen molecule. Now you can get ozone down on the surface of the planet that can be human-made and is functioning quite differently from the ozone here. So just forget about any other reference to ozone you've heard and focus on the stratosphere. Ozone, um, so you get um, two oxygen molecules and you get one O3 out of it and then another kind of free radical oxygen left to sort of wander around and carry on reacting. Ozone in the atmosphere protects us from UV and sunlight absorbing most of the incoming UV before it, um, sorry, just got to move something, Bef before it reaches the ground, it re radiates the energy as heat warming the stratosphere. And funnily enough, and you hopefully will have learned that the stratosphere gets colder the further, um, the higher you go, but the stratosphere um, gets warmer the higher you go. So it protects us from UV and sunlight, and we all know the connection between UV and, and sunlight. The ozone's hole is a major thinning. So it's not actually a hole, but it's a major thinning of the ozone layer in the atmosphere. And there's a, a picture of 1979 and 2008 where data has been entered, and obviously some clever Computer graphics has been used to actually sh show, and it kind of looks like a hole, but it's not a hole. It's where the ozone is thinner. 
and you can see that that extends all over Antarctica. And there's the bottom of South America, so we're going to be around here somewhere. And we are actually also affected by the thinning of the ozone layer, more so even than Australia, although Australia is hotter, um, not, um, and they also have a problem with UV. Uh, the hole appears in the winter over the poles, particularly the South Pole. Certain long-living chemicals that human released into the atmosphere, such as CFCs, destroyed ozone by chemical reactions. International agreements have banned the use of CFCs, which is helping mend the hole. But the interesting thing here is that's a real difference between the ozone layer story and the climate change story. The ozone layer story was. Um, it happened because of human-made chemicals, CFCs, stands for chlorofluorocarbon, something like that, but CFCs. They were used because they were excellent at helping refrigerators keep things closed. It was a very good gas to use in refrigerators. The trouble is that when refrigerators became too old and that, this gas escaped and went um, up through the troposphere and into the uh, stratosphere and was able to um, break down ozone molecules. Okay? So depletion of ozone, the ozone hole, was caused by long-living chemicals, CFCs, that humans released into the atmosphere. Now, this was a very, this was a relatively straightforward issue. There was this bunch of chemicals. So people then discovered other chemicals that could be used in fridges instead, and luckily they were a bit cheaper than the first lot, so that actually helped uptake as well. People have stopped using CFCs. Very few are released up to the atmosphere anymore, and the ozone hole is, is mending, which means that the concentration of ozone is getting thicker. Um, this all happened because there was an international agreement such as the Montreal protocol which banned the use of CFCs. So it was a relatively straight um, issue. Discover what it is, get rid of it, get new stuff, make it a bit cheaper, job done, right? Climate change is just not like that, sadly. But climate change is not about ozone and it's not about the stratosphere and it's not about UV. Greenhouse gases um, such as carbon dioxide and methane, are found in the troposphere. And the concentration of them spreads around the planet. So, you know, one of the issues of the moment is that the poor old Pacific Islanders have got sea level rise and are in real danger of losing their islands, their homes. You know, a tiny little scrap of an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean has not produced massive amounts of CO2. That's mostly been happening in the kind of the industrialization that's happened a heck of a lot of it, a vast proportion in the Northern Hemisphere. But it is people that are in the Southern Hemisphere that are actually suffering. Um, so the greenhouse gases from them have obviously been spread around the planet so that that greenhouse gas layer is everywhere. But also, um, the effects of sea level rise and things like that are going to be planetary wide. So there might there's a whole lot of ice melting in the Arctic right now. That is going to increase the volume of um, water, and that gradually will even out around the whole globe, causing um, inundation of particularly um, low lying island states like Pacific Islands. So it's very unfair because the Pacific Island people weren't the people that caused it, but they're actually suffering the consequences. Consequences. Okay, so just going through this, found in the troposphere, keep Earth warm, but extra greenhouse gases are accumulating, extra heat is trapped, warming the surface. Climate change is affected by many factors, which makes the issue very complex. So, and climate change cannot be easily fixed, as is seen by the, the, um, the, the very many COPs and climate change conferences that are being held all over the world. And we seem to be, um, you know, not making much progress at all. So 
just be aware that that is a, a set ozone layer and climate change are two separate issues. Okay, I've been through that. Oh, this actually just shows the clouds um, that the ozone depletion can actually um, occur on. Right, so that's actually finished and is probably all that I had planned on going through today. So I'll just stop. No, I'll just stop sharing. Um, are there any questions, Andrew? No, it looks all good for now. I'll give it 30 seconds um, just because there's a bit of a time delay on the stream. Um, oh, okay. But we'll give it give it 30 seconds. Hold on, I'm going to just try and refresh this. Just trying to think if there was anything else. I think I've pretty well done everything I wanted to cover. Um, and it is quite a long haul, three hours, so it won't matter if we finish a bit early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can always uh, edit this um, afterwards as well and scrub out that break um, and edit yeah. this bit out. But no, it looks, it looks like um, there are no other questions. I'll quickly just double check. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, no, I just yeah, switch my screen up. Well, we'll call it, call it an end for today then. Um, yeah. Right. So just just on behalf of um, of uh, well, Doug and I and um, and study it as well. Thank you for spending three hours to go over um, scholarship for earth and space science. I'm sure those who will end up watching this um, will find this very very helpful. Um, if if anyone else still watching um, has any questions, you can go to study it and ask them. Um, and you can just put them in there. Um, but, yeah, um, just a reminder that there's the folder in the description, um, which Jenny went over. Um, but other than that, Kakite, and everyone else, have a good day. Yeah, and, and good luck for the exam on Friday. That's the other thing. Yeah. Okay, should we just wait a couple of minutes to see if any questions come up? Yeah, and I'll try and see if I can close this uh, Stream. I'm not sure. We might just have to end this call. Right. By the way, if you haven't got access to, if you're still listening and you haven't got access to the resources, my email is at the beginning of a lot of um, the PowerPoints, but it's jenny at earthspacescience, or one word, um, dot org, dot nz. It's my email. Should I put that in the chat or will that? No, that we can't. Um, so that, no, it's a different chat, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be um, maybe put it in the folder. I think we might just end this call um, right. and I'll try and close the stream afterwards. Great. Okay, so I'll just go? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll okay. close this call. Thanks very much and thanks to Doug too. Although I'll see him on Friday, so. Yeah, yeah. okay. Bye. Good luck with the rest of your... Yeah.